Good evening, everyone. My name is Terrence Griffin, and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement at Rutgers University, Newark. I thank you all for being with us today. I'm pleased to welcome you to Art and Activism in the Age of Pandemic and Protest, a conversation with Professor Salamisha Tillett and Brittany Cooper. I'll take the next few moments to introduce our speakers and set some ground rules, and then we'll hop right on in. Salamisha received her PhD in the history of American civilization and AM in English from Harvard University. Salamisha is a Henry Rutgers Professor of African American Studies and Creative Writing at Rutgers University, Newark. Her book entitled Sites of Slavery, Citizenship and Racial Democracy in the Post-Civil Rights Imagination examines how contemporary African-American artists, writers, and intellectuals remember antebellum slavery within post-civil rights America in order to challenge the ongoing exclusion of African-Americans from America's civic myths and to model a racially democratic future. Her research interests include American studies, 20th and 21st century African-American literature, film, pop culture, cultural studies, and feminist theory. Throughout her career, Salamisha has been the recipient of multiple awards. She has also appeared on various networks, including the BBC, CNN, MSNBC, and NPR. She's also written blogs and editorials for the Atlantic, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, and many others. Brittany received her PhD in American Studies from Emory University. Brittany is the Associate Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She is co-editor of the Crunk Feminist Collection and the author of both Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thoughts of Race Women, and Eloquent Rage, a Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower. In particular, this work interrogates the manner in which public Black women have theorized racial identity and gender politics, and the methods they've used to operationalize those theories for the uplift of Black communities. Using Black feminist thought to understand contemporary articulations of Black womanhood is Dr. Cooper's other major research area. She has published several book chapters and articles on representations of Black women in popular culture, including a piece on the representation of the baby mama figure in hip hop music and film, the Feminist Implications of Janet Jackson's 2004 Super Bowl Mishap, and the importance of Michelle Obama in the tradition of Black female leadership. Now, in terms of tonight, if you have questions for our presenters during the discussion, please feel free to submit them on the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen. We'll do our best to accommodate as many questions as possible, given the time restrictions that we do have. For your convenience, this presentation is being recorded, and after the event, it will be posted and uploaded to the Rutgers Alumni YouTube channel, and all attendees and registrants will receive an email link once that link is live. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Salamisha and Brittany. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Brittany. Thank you, Stephanie and Terrence for um, inviting us in that really wonderful and thoughtful introduction. Yes. Brittany, we're Yay. here. Yay. <laughs> My friend. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you. You have so many great projects going on. Um, I thought we would begin actually with your first book, Sites of Slavery, because it strikes me that it comes out in a vastly different political moment, 2012, than this moment. And so I wonder 
how you think the political demands of the Trump era and its racial politics diverge from that which was uh, from 2012, which was decidedly in the middle of the Obama moment. And I'm thinking about this with regard to both your conversation about civic myths, but also about notions of critical patriotism in sites of slavery. Uh, thank you. Um... You know, when I was revising the book, well, I guess I should go back. Um, you know, I was obsessed with and really um, interested in thinking about slavery, but not slavery, um, the institution proper, but the ways in which African American artists, really from the 1960s to the early 2000s, had decided to and kept on returning to slavery as a thematic in their work. So, novelists and uh, playwrights, uh, performers, and filmmakers. And so the funny thing is the year that I was like revising the book, Obama, and I thought that um, my thesis, which was really a question of why in the post-civil rights period were African-American artists so preoccupied with this theme of slavery? Um, it only compared to the, the, the time of slavery itself, right? So from, you know, obviously during slavery and, and the emergence of slave narratives, Slavery would be the primary topic to, to, to try to grapple with, but also it was the institution one had to defeat in order to be a citizen, to be human, to be free. And for most of the 20th century, African-American writers didn't really centralize slavery in their work, right? And so then you get an emergence of all these novels um, from really about 69 on, um, and then you get a real resurgence of these things in the 1990s when I was in college. So when I was in college, almost every year, there was like a new novel on slavery. And I thought that was so peculiar and strange and wondered why that was happening. And so my argument in Sites of Slavery was that in the post-civil rights era, when African-Americans have all the markers of citizenship, right? That's, that's what the civil rights movement in many ways was about, was about getting the, the kind of um, legal protections of citizenship that had been denied to African-Americans as a result of segregation. So once you have the, the 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 protocols, the the laws, the the um, the, the things that you can wrap yourself up around and that are supposed to make you a citizen. Then why do you still not feel like you're a citizen? And so I talked about um, something not just like the legal markers of citizenship, but citizenship is a way of feeling. It's a way of being. It's a way of understanding your relationship to the nation. And so that's what I described as civic estrangement, right? So you can be a legal citizen of a place you can still feel like you don't belong. So when Obama was elected, I was like, oh my God, my book is in the past tense. You know, we have um, an African-American man as the head of the country. So how much more can you be part of the national state uh, or the nation state, um, you know, with Obama's presidency? I thought, well, maybe that this was the end of, of all these claims that African-Americans had, have, have, had to have had um, to belong to the nation. And yet, that was not true. So I remember talking to my uh, good colleague, Thaddeus, and saying, oh my God, I gotta write this book in past tense. And she was really helpful in helping me understand another way of thinking about both Obama and also um, that he's a, he was a byproduct of these demands, not necessarily um, the demands of inclusion and demands of being part of the, the nation state, both legally, but also uh, emotionally. Um, and yet, you know, right as soon as Obama um, became president, there was a real resurgence of secessionist balls, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, as we are dealing with right now, the, the ways in which the Confederate Jews were very much a contested site. They're always a contested site. But with Obama's, I mean, now we can say this clearly that we saw this emergence of uh, a racial backlash, but um, there were these cultural indicators um, in which his presidency um, led to a kind of neo-confederacy. Yes. Um, and so yeah. that, that's what was going on at the same time. So my book in many ways was trying to, it comes out in 2012. So it's the, the, the year in which he's reelected. Um, yeah. And we'd seen that those, debates, you know, Tea Party seems like a old fashioned term now with the a, a current regime, but the emergence of the Tea Party um, made me think that there was going to be a huge set of people and mechanisms to maintain African Americans not feeling like they fully belonged in the nation. Oh, wow. so, so your next question was like, what do I think of now? I guess <laughs> like, how does this sound? Yeah, like what's, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, what was, what's been most interesting um, has been the resurgence of text on slavery, right? So it's, yep. it's, Skin. And so yeah, so it's almost like, 
Uh, and I remember there were these debates, these were some, somewhat academic debates, but they were also debates among writers, like a writer named, like Charles Johnson, um, mm -hmm. I kind of critiqued Morrison uh, for publishing a mercy, because why are we still, in this moment of Obama, why are we preoccupied with the theme of slavery? And yeah. yet what we saw was um, so many writers uh, of our generation actually taking up that tradition um, mm -hmm. and so many artists, uh, visual artists and um, dancers and, and musicians returning to slavery. So it's the ongoingness of American racism and that slavery both the mark of our, of, of black, you know, non-humanness in a way, but also it is the thing that also rendered us American. And so it's a, we're gonna keep on coming back to it because it's foundational, um, but also it's the thing we have to reckon with. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking me about Titus. <laughs> yeah. About it a lot. yeah, no, it feels super important in this moment, in part because, you know, folks are in the street and they're protesting and they're knocking over Confederate statues or being very happy when the weather knocks them over. And, um, you know, and so it feels to me like we're grappling with, you know, uh, and, and we also see the right deploying this this discourse of patriots again. Right. Yes. And so this idea that you have about the, the sort of critical ways that black folks enact that feels really relevant, you know, in this. Oh, yeah, that's the, yeah. So I guess that's the other part of the thesis. So I, I described civic, the feeling of non belonging um, and critical patriotism, which is not a term I exclusively use. Other theorists have, have, have used it, but it's a way of thinking about um, I, I traced it to Douglas and his um, speech. Uh, his 4th of July speech and the ways in which African Americans have, uh, and not just African Americans, but in the case that I'm talking about African Americans have modeled a kind of uh, citizenship and a patriotism um, in which democracy is the thing to aspire to. And the way to get there is to constantly demand, critique, engage, um, and organize around those institutions and those individuals that are um, trying to um, contain it and, and trying not to really be able, really not to live out this democratic dream. And so, um, you know, this is a long tradition. I mean, there's no shortage of people that, you, that I've written about that fit into this tradition. Um, but I guess the most obvious one for our purposes would be Colin Kaepernick, right? Um, that's a critical <laughs> patriot, right? The way in which he was actually pulling on uh, a tradition of uh, civil dissent and um, political um, critique um, in order to imagine an America that was free of police violence. And so it's always interesting to think about the ways in which people considered him not a patriot when the very thing that he was doing was so fundamentally patriotic. But I, I guess the, the challenge is it's a patriotism for America that has yet to become what the demand is. And so maybe that's I mean, outside of like obvious racism. America has yet to live up to this obligation. Um, and so to be a patriot to something that is not yet realized is something that's a, that's a it's very complicated. So. Yeah, yeah. So your your new book, which I've had the pleasure of reading. I know, you're so uh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. You're <laughs> which I'm really yeah. excited. Look, part I'm of the reason I'm excited about your new book is because I don't know if you know, I helped process that Alice Walker archive at Emory. I processed all the writing <laughs> in that archive. And so- I think you mentioned it, but now that we're seeing each other, that is a, a massive collection. So yeah. that's yeah, she's stunning. Everything. Yeah. She's everything. Yeah, and so I got to see the green notebook that the original draft of The Color Purple is in, which is so amazing. And so, you know, one, I just want that, you know, that book, because it wins the Pulitzer and then the subsequent film are both iconic. But I, so I wonder one, why, why talk about, why do you think in this moment, this is the story that we need? And two, like, can we talk about the way that the color purple shifted like representational possibility for black women? Because that is such a critical focus of your work and something you are quite passionate about. Um, and it, it, it occurs to me that so much of what's possible now was made possible by that book and by that film. Yeah, you know, there's a beautiful line at the end of my book that Beverly Guy Sheftall writes in the afterward, um, in which she um, is quoting uh, a literary critic um, about Alice Walker. And uh, Alice Walker, I'm paraphrasing, um, really saw the souls of Black women or believed in the souls of Black women 
And I was like, mm. oh, that's so nice. Like, I want somebody to say that about me one day. You know, it's just, it, 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 because it, it, on so many levels, it's a very, um, such a beautiful sentiment and it's such a beautiful practice. And so the color purple, you know, I'm working on this book on Nina Simone, which is the ongoing project, which I'm actually very excited about and I'm writing and now the color purple book is done. So I'm returning to Nina. Uh, and so in the process of writing this book about Nina Simone, um, I had the opportunity to, well, when I was imagining researching doing all this stuff on Nina Simone, um, I had the opportunity to, to write a book about uh, the color purple, uh, a book that has meant tremendous, uh, meant much to me. Um, the story I always say is that the summer before my freshman year, my senior year in college, I read three books that changed my life. Um, the first was Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. The second one was Alex Haley and Malcolm X's, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And the third was The, was the Color Purple. And so like, I just feel like if you ever need to understand me, those three books kind of give you like all the information you need. Um, and so I read The Color Purple um, and was just, you know, who is not intrigued by the story of, of Seely and the story of the community of women and men that Seely finds herself in and the way in which she heals. But I, for me in particular, I read the book and then I go to college and I'm sexually assaulted my freshman year. Mm -hmm. And so on a very fundamental level, I identified with Seely's plight. Um, and so uh, in some ways on, on some subconscious level, I think the color purple has always um, been a model for me in terms of how I, I could heal. And so my story, I'm very public about it. As you know, um, I was sexually assaulted my freshman year of college, sexually assaulted again when I went on a study abroad program uh, to Nairobi, yeah. Kenya. And yeah. so I think there are very few, I mean, there's a handful of books that really tell the story of sexual assault from the the black woman survivor's perspective, right? So Maya Angelou, um, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, um, The Bluest Eye, um, Gloria Naylor's uh, Women of Brewster Place, and on and on. But The Color Purple, I think, what Alice Walker is able to do in that book is not give us the survivor's perspective, but also show us what healing looks like, um, what uh, healing of oneself, falling in love with oneself, falling in love with another woman, in love with family and community and having a really extensive and expansive notion of God looks like. And we're in this era of me too. So I was able to, to see, write this book in this moment. Um, and there's so much that we are indebted to that in some ways you would feel like the book, you know, the book, we can take it for granted in so many ways because so much of what she was envisioning, whether it was around sexuality or sexual assault, um, are now part of our everyday discourse. Uh, and yet to me, what still is yet to be is this figure of Mr. Uh, and so I've gone to the books, I've taught the book, I've so many different types of people to high schoolers. Um, and the book I talk about teaching the book and film to a group of um, Afri most African-American boys at a school for adjudicated youth in Philadelphia. I've taught it to college classes. Um, and, and so I always learn something about myself. I learned something about the community of, of students that I'm, I'm engaging. I learned something about the world. And so this time I've also been really fascinated by Mr. Because again, since we're in this moment in which we're really having complicated conversations about sexual violence and what does accountability look like, Mr. still is such an elusive figure um, in, in our real world, right? And so we, we rarely have yet to see anyone, at least a major public figure, go through that process of accountability, of redemption, of atonement. And so different stages of my life and in different moments of my political journey, the color purple, I just constantly am learning from the color purple. And I think that it's really interesting for us to kind of grapple with that. And then the other thing about the color purple, which is a theme, I think, when we talk about sites of slavery or we talk about the color purple or we talk about Nina Simone is like, I'm obsessed with afterlives. Like I'm obsessed with why things have a moment and certain things keep on having moments. And yeah. those moments tell us something, like I just said, about who we are and who we need to be. And so what is yeah. the color purple? It, it wasn't just a book, it was like a movie, yeah. musical. And now there's yeah. a musical of the movie coming, right? And so. Part of it's just the, the brilliance of her um, writing and her story. And there's something about it that we're just connecting to in, in the same way with someone like Nina Simone or 
this theme of slavery. So that's kind of my, if I, it's, you know, we, we write and we uh, analyze text and sometimes we can turn that back on ourselves. And so if I could find my own pattern, it's this uh, interest in our lives and the political and cultural meaning of things that live beyond the moment they're supposed to in some way. Yeah, no, I mean, it's absolutely this kind of, say, Dia Hartman moment writ really large. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you about Me Too. I mean, you've been in the trenches as an anti-rape organizer for a really long time. You work with Black girls, survivors. You work with Black girls in Chicago. You have the nonprofit on Long Walk Home. And I wonder, like, what your hope and dream is, you know, like, what is what is your feeling about Me Too? Has it been... Um, do you feel like it has moved the needle or, you know, do you feel like black women and girls are finally having their say? What, what do you imagine? What, you know, beyond like ending sexual violence, which is what we all want, you know, what are the things that you want to see happen in the movement going forward? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I came to the movement as a, as a victim of sexual assault and I stayed in the movement in order to make sure that no one else ever experienced the trauma I did. And I was also to be born into a family in which my sister Shahrazad was my sister, right? And so um, when I disclosed to her in uh, 1998 uh, that I was, 1997, that I was sexually assaulted, um, you know, Shahrazad, who is an art therapist, who's a photographer, and who's the executive director of a long walk home. Um, back then, you know, we were really young. We we're like in our early twenties, and she asked if she could photograph my healing, and I was like, "Oh, well, well, no!" I first told her we didn't know what to do. She was my first family member that I told, um, and then over the course of the year, she would visit me, and I was actively healing. Um, and what's interesting is Shahrazad went to Tufts, but she was she spent a semester at the Mason Gross School. Um, okay. and yeah, yeah, it's, it's like weird records is all, always there. Um, and she had a class with a, a photographer and a, a teacher named uh, Steve Hart, and she took a social documentary class. And in that class, people photographed meaningful things to them. People photographed one student I know photographed her mother who was, um, living with cancer and Steve Hart, her teacher had photographed a family in the Bronx that had for seven years. And so Shahrazad's first photograph of me um, was taken during a, a homecoming event. I went to the University of Pennsylvania and I saw my perpetrator at this event. And so Cher took a picture of me later that day and um, that became the beginning of, 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 of a story of a rape survivor performance in the photographic journey. And then we created a long walk home from that. So I think, you know, sisterhood is so fundamental. Again, the color purple and the way in which sisterhood is ex very expansive there. Um, Celia and Nettie's relationship being the relationship of love that's like that needs to be repaired for Celia to be whole. But my own relationship to my sister and her. And her so I dedicate that book to, to her um, and her compassion but also like, what does it mean to create a movement or an, or an organization and then a movement out of this model of sisterhood? Um, sisterhood, and you and I were in a panel years ago when I, I think it was on Serena and Venus. Do you remember oh, this yes. panel? That was yeah, fun. That, exactly, that. it was fun. And and then we were talking about sisterhood as a, their, their relationship as a kind of, um, model of a democracy as opposed to like fraternity, like we could think of there, you know, so, Sister is very important to me, and um, and therefore I think everything kind of comes from there. My 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 love of and for black girls and women, my desire for their freedom or our freedom and liberation, and I also think I'm a very firm believer. I, I think of the Combahee River Collective Statement as a constitutional document um, that you know what they say there that when those of us who are the most marginalized, the most vulnerable are free, then it does necessitate the freedom of everyone else. When black girls and women are free, you, you have to um, disentangle so many forms of oppression at once for that to be, be made possible. Uh, anyway, so I was speaking to you because you know all this stuff, but uh, hopefully some other people are <laughs> yeah. learning some new things. Well, well, and I was also thinking that it's such an interesting moment for black girls in the world, right? Because, you know, um, 
when you know Darnella Frazier is a 17 year old girl who taped the killing of George Floyd right Rachel Dantel was Rachel was was Trayvon Martin's 18 year old friend who's on the phone with him and when he gets accosted and so there's a way that black girls are witnesses to these atrocities but I but I wonder in your work with black girls do you feel like the that that black girls ever get to be at the center of our national conversations around these things right because they're always doing critical labor to bring our attention to things right or like i spent some time this summer organizing um to help uh release grace a 15 year old black girl in yes. michigan but thank you up because of home you know not doing her homework in a pandemic right um and so you know i just wonder if we know how to talk about black girls and you have been so committed to that work you know what how can we take care of black girls better um you know what can we do yeah i guess i would say that what i've noticed is maybe the time gap and their invisibility and the demand for their visibility is decreasing that's the only thing it's not girls and black women are being centered um still it's just that they're because black women um are the major organizers um of, of both in many ways, Me Too, but also um, of Black Lives Matter, that I guess lag or gap between remembering that we forgot about women and girls who are also yeah. being murdered um, yeah. and organizing around them ha is decreasing. And it's only because of us doing the work. It's not because there's any um, natural or uh, knee-jerk desire to center Black girls and women, but I do think um, we, we're starting to remember quicker, uh, which is a tragic reality, but also pro progress in some ways. And I say this because, um, I mean, what's happening with Taylor is really pretty, it, it speaks to both of these things, right? That there is still no major accountability in terms of arrest, um, and yet the demand um, for her story to be at the forefront of her consciousness um, is different than it was with we've been organizing around at a long walk home around rakia boyd who um mm -hmm. was also murdered in 2012 by a police officer outside in public um and a lot of the organizers in chicago at long walk home or black lives matter chicago or sada's daughter have really made sure that um their uh that her story was kept alive and also her brother uh, martina sutton um really has made sure that her her, her legacy is kept alive but between, so, the, so there's a, but now with Brianna, there's a lot more visibility. So I would say that most people still probably don't know Rakia Boyd's name. Um, and then if you kind of track it, then you get to Sandra Bland, where there's an increase. And now we have um, Brianna Taylor. And yet that's still not enough, right? That's still not enough. And, you know, this is not about comparing which Black death should be mourned more. Right. It's to say that Black death um, and Black life uh, all of it is it, black. All of black life is valuable, um, and so I think it behooves us as a people to continue to demand for the freedom of us all. Yeah. I don't know, did I answer your question? I don't know. If you I did. It. It. Yeah. Okay. So I, you know, I want to talk about art because you oh, art. As, <laughs> uh, look, art and activism. Um, yeah. So thinking about art, and you know, first you talked about it as a mode of healing that both that it was a collective thing that you did with your sister, the, the photographs, the performance. Um, and so I wonder like what your models have been for the way you have merged art in your academic practice. Cause I don't know if all of you know, many of you do know Salamisha, but you know, she is a badass and like one of the most cool and interesting and insightful academics that I know. Um, I remember when you presented on that Nina Simone work, you know, when we first met. Uh you know, almost 10 years ago now, weirdly yeah. enough. And, you know, everybody in the room was just draw, you know, jaws dropped because the performance was just so amazing. The, like, literally the, the, the conceptual richness of your work. And so you have managed to merge a, like, level of very high academic rigor, rigor with a commitment to, like, accessible writing and to artistic practices, like a critical part of your practice. And did, did you have models for that or people who inspired that for you? Yeah, thank you. You're so nice. Um, I was trying to think of when we first met, and so it was because you like the the 
intellectual history conference at Columbia. Okay, so that's what I thought. But if, you know, I'd known you. I mean, your your digital media presence was uh, so strong then. Your game was so tight then that I I thought I knew you before that because I was like, but that couldn't be it because we connect easily and so quickly. Yeah. yeah, which is another way of saying that like your spirit as a black feminist is so good. You know, there lots of people have different labels, but every once in a while. Um, there are people who live and and breathe the practice and and I mean that is like the highest compliment to, to say that you live and practice black feminism and so yeah when we met I, th I thought we met before that so that's so interesting but um and yeah look where we are now and your books um uh you were you were presenting um from your first book as well so it's so exciting yeah. that we're here <laughs> um so yeah art so I grew up in a house uh, my mother is a music jazz musician and so i grew okay. up um with like an active soundtrack my mother's from newark which is where i i work and i live in now um which is also a very rich artistic and activist city or artist activist city um and then my father is from trinidad and so my sister and i when we, we share our biographies um my father gave my sister her camera also if you like we lived in trinidad as children and it's a country that's you know carnival is like the, like the central operating system of the entire nation. And so, and Carnival grew as, uh, grew out of um, a kind of, um, you know, uh, enslaved people uh, resisting their slave masters through cultural forms. So for me, art and black freedom have always been intimately tied. So I don't know a world in which um, art and multiple modalities of art haven't existed. I think it's just the way I see the world, um, but I didn't always see myself as an artist. I saw myself as a scholar. Um, I saw myself as a reader or critic of art um, and through the Nina Simone project and then ultimately even the Alice Walker project, the Color Purple project, I began to see myself as, as a writer. Um, and so I think for me, I've been really interested in the way in which artistic practices do so much political Right. So not only do they like change people's consciousness, like they can help you see someone, you know, if you never met a black person and you watch a variety of, you know, shows with black people, it may change your relationship even temporarily. I don't know if it's going to do a long term, but it may change your understanding of what black life could be, or it can demonize black people to the point where it only reaffirms your stereotypes. But culture has, so that's just on a consciousness level. And then I've always been interested and how art can organize and mobilize people. And so because of the Nina Simone project, I really had to understand the way in which art functioned during the civil rights movement. And so the SNCC used photography and the freedom songs to galvanize and to resist and to recruit and to create empathy. And so it's just a really important and highly underestimated tool of political mobilization. Um, so mm -hmm. it's consciousness raising, it's a, a, it mobilizes people, and then it also uh, can imagine the world, like I was talking about before, when I was talking about critical patriotism, it can imagine the world that we have yet to create. And so, and so only the artists that do that, the legislators tend to have to catch up, or the policymakers have to catch up to the artist. And so why not follow those who have already, who have already imagined something so much more beautiful than what, what we know, and try to create what they see as our reality. And so I guess, I don't know. I mean, I think that's just amazing that like there are multiple forms that can do that and can achieve that. And, you know, as a reader um, and as an African American, um, I'm half sure I didn't have African American, but as an African American, just to know that the slave narratives um, are our tradition, and right? And, and the ways in which um, enslaved people wrote their way or try to write, write their way out of slavery, but not just themselves, but millions of, of their sisters and brothers out of slavery. I mean, that's that's our inheritance. And so um, we can think about the slave narratives as a political treaties, and you can also think about them as artistic text. And so they are both. And so I think those are examples for me of the way the possible art kind of gives us. And so now here at Rutgers and Rutgers Newark and Literally, I'm in um, Express Newark, which is uh, a center um, for socially engaged art here um, in at Rutgers and in Newark. It's, it's pretty exciting to be able to 
let me kind of institutionalize this work. I've done it with Along Walk Home, and now I'm doing it here at, at Rutgers itself. And then as a critic, I'm just obsessed with, I just like writing about art. I, I love trying to understand and explain and interpret and teach people um, maybe how you can read something that you are unfamiliar with or you may have missed. So. No, it's, I mean, we so need, you know, we need art and creativity and just a new, a different mode of being in this moment where everything feels apocalyptic and terrible, frankly. And so, you know, we need kind of artistic imagination to imagine what the world will be after this one. Swiftly, it feels like passes away. I, one of the things that you write a lot about and that you seem really excited about is like what's happening with Black women in representation. And so as I was looking back over your catalog of writing, you get to interview the coolest people. You've interviewed Oprah, <laughs> Shonda Ron, like you interview it, you know, talk to so many people, but you also so one, you have this commitment in your praxis, I think as a black feminist scholar and creative to, to centering black women's cultural production, which is super interesting in a moment when there seems to be some like debate about whether representation matters now, you know, like there's a real, like people seem to really be struggling with re whether representation matters. And then I go back and I read your work over and over again. And I'm like, of course it matters. We, we are just now starting to get some some in, some representations that are complex and wonderful in a in a massive scale and so like what excites you about black women's cultural production right now there's so much good stuff going on um what do you, what do you see and 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 what you know what gives you joy um yeah um well what i forgot to answer the question of model so i will do that quickly yes. and then okay. get to this one yep. that was um my bad um uh, well you're obviously a, a model for me um I was fortunate to be an undergrad and have fair Jasmine Griffin um, as a professor of mine in of Pennsylvania. And I remember being in a talk, I was a senior, and uh, Mathieu Diawar, the professor from NYU, was presenting a, a film that he did. And fair had asked, and I was also in a class with her that semester, a class that, had, that she, when she was writing her Billie Holiday book, which oh, wow. also gave me permission to write a book about Nina Simone. And Fair asked a question that was so, it was like very lucid, mm -hmm. like you could understand her question. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, wow, like, cause you know, the academic performance is of, oh, of is very obtuse. Yeah. Like the more people you cite, the more brilliant you are. Um, and I was like, wow, like it just floored me and it relieved me to be able to see someone who everyone respected. No one thought her question was like silly or simple, uh, but the way in which she was able to say it with such confidence and clarity was like, oh, I was able to exhale. And so then I, um, I've also had the good fortune when I went to, so Farrah was is a model and a very strong model of black feminism um, for me. And then when I went to grad school, um, I had, it was like the, you know, the heyday of like um, Cornell and Skip um, at, at Harvard. And I remember Skip Gates, who is, was uh, Werner Solis and Skip Gates were my um, uh, dissertation advisors. And I remember Skip at one point, cause he was started doing his, his like um, his films and his, his mm -hmm. TV shows. This was when he first started doing this, this series um, at, at PBS and despite the fact that he like had signifying monkey which is a tome for us literary critics by the time that i met him he was really talking about a language that was accessible to uh multiple audiences so then and then cornell obviously had already been renowned for for doing that so then i was at harvard and i was like oh okay so like this is you know this is the the the, the of the black public intellectual um and then when I went to Penn um, and Michael Eric Dyson was there, and so he was another figure. Um, and then I've just had a lot of different mentors, Beverly Guy Sheftal, people who are really committed to lucidity. And so that just opened up my, my world um, in terms of an academic path uh, for doing this. In terms of writers, I would say that um, I was, you know, you real, read Pearl Cleage's like essays or Bell Hooks's essays. Um, that kind of gave me permission to think about the essay in that in those ways of, of the personal political essay. And then of course, Baldwin and Lord and Alice Walker. Um, so yeah, I just think I've been really fortunate. And then our generation, I mean, you're, I'm older than you, but we're I think in the same academic and, and yes. life generation. 
um, have been able, we don't, we don't inherit, you know, when those, that generation, right, uh, Skip and Cornell and all those people, they were, the idea of black public intellectual was like highly controversial. We yeah. didn't have those same debates because we inherited a legacy from them. So I think we also had a freedom to kind of path, chart the path that we wanted to. But I think for me with the Nina Sound book, I, I also wanted to write a book that um, many people would read. And so I had to retrain myself as a writer, which I think most academics don't necessarily talk about or um, acknowledge. But for me, when I started blogging in 2008 and then writing for The Root and then writing for The Nation and now for The Times, that was all in service of writing a book that would be readable. And it was a very, it has been a very long process for me to go from being a tr more traditional academic to being a, a creative writer. So, okay. But then you had another question about representation. Yeah, which is our last question. And then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah. So why did I write it about, well, there's a Toni Morrison quote. I'm really bad at um, saying the quote exactly the way the person says it, but uh, Morrison, I remember someone asked her like, you know, why would you about black women? And she was, she talks about it in such a way that well, what else? It's such a deep place to write from. Yeah. And I find writing about like, cause I'm like a, I, I love a challenge and I love, like I'm a, a thinker and I find to be able to write about black women requires a lot. It, it's so rigorous. You have to be so good. And because it's like dealing with race and gender and sexuality and class, like, right? Like it's not a single narrative. And so you have to be able to deal with those things and then tell a cohesive story. And for me, the challenge also is because I write a, a lot about black women and black girls, how do I tell a story uniquely each time? And so um, there's obviously a through line in my work, but with each subject, um, like I wrote a piece recently on Camille Brown and social dance, that's gonna look really different than a piece on Oprah Winfrey, right? Even though they're both black women who are like top of their game and really committed to like art and social change and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, but a lot of those pieces, like they're like things that I really want to write about. So I, they may appear in the times, um, which I'm very thankful for, but I'm really just like watching and paying attention. And um, like, we can learn so much from black women's um, about the way yeah. the world should be. So I'm just trying to give a gift to us as black women and girls, but also to the world by uh, thinking through their work uh, honestly and robustly. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Let's talk to the audience. <laughs> I got the questions. Audience. What should we talk about? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We can hear you. Great, great. So there are a few that were sent before, and then there are a few that were sent uh, during. Uh, so I'll try to categorize them as best I can. Uh, the first question uh, is for both of you all, I assume, feel free to jump in, is a more uh, general question of, do you think that art should um, disturb the comfortable or comfort the disturbed? It's mm. <laughs> a very thoughtfully worded question. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? I think disturb the comfortable. Mm. But what do you mean? What was it? Disturbed? Does the disturbed yeah. mean like those on the margins? I could do well, both, I, I it, suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I look, I think I think there's I mean, this is the oldest debate in black art, you know, like what is the purpose of black art, right? Yeah. I mean, artists in the 1920s are debating that. And I think the short answer is that part of what I take from Salamisha's work that is so generative and essential is that Black women are engaged in world-making projects because they use art and representation as a way to tell us what's possible. And so I'm less interested in whether it's being comforting or disturbing and more interested in what kind of worlds does Black art tell us could be possible, right? And um, uh, and so I think that that is going to be disturbing to people who are comfortable in social positions of privilege. And I think that it's going to be comforting or, and it, look, it might not even be comforting to people who have been disturbed or uh, mistreated by these systems, but I think it, I think it can be inspiring or that it can be grounding or that it can just simply be a reminder that this is not all there is. Yeah. 
And another one here is, um, can you talk about or share your thoughts on uh, film and movies in terms of access and opportunities for Black women and the stories they should or could tell? Mm. Yeah, um, well, there's a really great film festival going on right now called the New Neg by the New Negress uh, Society, the film. So that's all about Black women's uh, films, and it's really beautifully curated. And I, I apologize if I got the name wrong, but I knew it, at least I know the, the first part, the New Negress uh, Collective. Um, I think it's very difficult. So, so my first year in 2007, I taught a class called 20th Century Black Women Filmmakers and Writers. And the reason I had to put the writers in is because um, at that time, uh, there was only one uh, African American, one or two African American filmmakers who had been to do two feature films, right? And so, of course, now we're in a different era in which there are people who've been able to do multiple films. And yet, there's still so few Black women who are able to make a feature film. So we're still, we have progress, um, but it also, it's very much a, a white man's medium, right? In a different way than poetry is or, or writing or maybe um, other art forms, film is very much um, an expensive uh, form. Uh, to have a studio film requires so many mechanisms to be in your favor and so many people to green light your project. So I think black women are still uh, while there, much has been um, moved or, and much has been made, it's still incredibly difficult for Black women to, to make a major Hollywood film. Now, as a result, though, we do see Black women making really dynamic and innovative short films um, and sometimes um, longer feature films. I'm doing a piece right now on this. Uh, there's a short film on Netflix called Love Song for Latasha. It's a gorgeous experimental documentary um, on um, Latasha Harland, teenage girl who was shot um, uh, to death in a grocery store in Los Angeles um, right before Rodney King by a Korean uh, grocer. And it, it was the, you know, if, if we go back in time, this is the thing we were talking about earlier with like Rakia Boyd, like um, there was a lot of anger and animosity around her murder um, that was also swallowed up in the rebellion in LA um, regarding uh, the Rodney King verdict, or the verdict of the LAPD PD officers who were acquitted um, after beating Rodney King. So Latasha Harlan's in LA, you would remember her. You, she was part of that story. The story of consciousness, she's been written out of it. And so this is a beautiful film about black girlhood, um, but it's also a really important, just experimental documentary. And so I'm giving like lots of love right now, but I think everyone should see it. And it's coming out, I think next week or whatever. So, um, so that's that's where we are. We're, we're black women are able to make films, shorter films, um, but I would love to see experimental long films and also major studio, major Hollywood studio productions. That's still to really happen. Did I take up all the <laughs> yeah. other answer? Okay. <laughs> no, that was good. We've got a, a few more moments, so we're going to do uh, two more questions here. Uh, one here is. Uh, Given your journey towards public, uh, critical, and excuse me, artistic practice, how might we reimagine graduate studies and undergraduate programs focused on Black literary and cultural studies? Uh, what role uh, could those programs play in art and justice work? You can hand it to you. Okay. Well, they would, they ask you, but um... okay. No. Again, yeah. I'm sure you've lots of thoughts on this. <laughs> um, I'll just offer that what I'm doing in my graduate seminar this semester is I'm asking my students to actually write op-eds and think pieces each week as the response to the text with a very specific mandate to translate their academies into, you know, to, to imagine who their audience would be as someone other than other academics, and then to translate the most critical parts of the argument they want to make for a broader audience. Um, and so really trying to train them to think and write differently with the assumption that they want to actually um, build audiences beyond the academy. No, that's a great. Um, here, there was a course, I said I teach in the creative writing department in, in AFAM, um, but there's a course that we teach here, um, students uh, 
like writing for the public or public writing. And I was like, oh man, I wish I took that course. When, I mean, that course didn't exist when I was in grad school. But I would have loved to have taken a course like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, well, Brittany just gave a really wonderful example of the way in which, uh, how do you imagine multiple audiences and multiple publics at once? Um, and not every academic necessarily wants to do that. Um, but what I would say is that one of, as someone who does that work, uh, I love the fact that I've been trained as an academic uh, because I think you and I have this arsenal of like, information. We know how to access um, uh, the archive. We know where to get, you know, academics write about everything like all the time in such depth. And so for me, as someone who moves in and out of those spaces, not only does it, am I committed to like, you know, uh, showcasing the way that academic scholars are engaging these kind of broad topics, but also like, there's just the, like the, the just so good that um, it just makes our work better as well. So that's a great question. Yeah, also encourage your students to be scholars first. The lure of the public is so interesting, but what I hear Salamisha saying is this thing about the need to have critical rigor and depth and very often they wanna skip over the kind of deep depth that scholarship requires in order to get to some of the kind of public carrots and those things are more immediately rewarding but then you know you you want to be able to have some gravitas to the things you say you want to be able to back up the stuff that you're writing and talking about and that's the role of the scholar so don't diminish the scholarly piece for the public piece they really do go hand in hand yeah or don't want to be a celebrity at the expense talk about it that's a <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm sure we're massive people accuse us of all sorts of stuff, but I do think I mean, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a different yeah, conversation. People do. People, people are seeing this, look, it, it is one of my biggest rants. People are seeing the public stuff as a pathway to fame. Oh, I could be on television. Oh, I can whatever. And it's like, all that stuff is cool. Me and you used to love to do MHP shows, a lot of fun. Like, yeah, that was it's good. cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it's like, but at the end of the day, both of us are nerds. Like, you are a, a scholar, you know, and then and from that grows all of this other work. Uh, and so many folks are just like, I just, you know, I just want to be a celebrity and I want a Twitter followers. And it's like, I think that we've been, we have not trained our students well, if that is what they think this enterprise is. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't trained them as well as we've been trained, I guess. <laughs> I'm <excited about> it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very last one. Who are some of the young black artists uh, who are most important to you right now? So mm -hmm. if you name some folks, but we never got anything from uh, you, Brittany. Oh, did oh, am who <laughs> who what, whose art do I like? I mean, in visual art, I mean, I'm an Ava DuVernay stan. Have been since our very first indie film. Um, I, you know, I like what Issa Rae is doing. I'm very interested in her journey because I've been down with her since Awkward Black Girl. Um, I'm learning that Eloquent Rage is like, you know, it was referenced in the Lovecraft Country um, podcast this week, which is hilarious to me. Um, you know, and, and then there are all kinds of like Black writers and creatives that I actually have been having the opportunity to have some conversations with um, out in California, particularly before the pandemic about representation. So I like their work. Um, visual art is the thing where I don't always have a ready catalog, but where I am sort of checking for what is going on. So that's the place that I'm trying to grow now in my own kind of cultural practice is really, you know, learning more about black visual artists. So. Are there any other names that you'd like to suggest? So let me show. Oh, yeah. I mean. I was like, I love listening to Brittany. Um, yeah, I mean, my colleague, Jordan Castile, um, but I don't, you know, she now she's on the cover of, but um, she's a really um, gorgeous uh, artist. Um, There's a filmmaker that I'm working on a project with, Yvonne Shirley, who um, is really into experimental documentaries and Black women's interiority. Um, I mean, I feel like I could just name per genre. I want to, I mean, Lovecraft Country is doing quite well, but I think Misha Green is so from um, underground and to Lovecraft Country. I think it's so smart, and I was able to interview her recently. I, I w Michaela Coles, like I may destroy you, was, and I wrote recently. I mean, I 
that was extraordinary. Um, and so on so many, on a narrative level, on a representational level, um, on a therapeutic and cathartic, I, I was like, oh. you know, every once in a while there's, oh, sorry, I'm, there's I'm, part that comes that you couldn't predict. And so I just love when I experience that. Um, but there's a lot of mediums that we can talk about. So I'm gonna, yeah, Brittany, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Katori Hall in Pea Valley is like my favorite Southern thing right now. I'm a Southern woman and so, I love the writing and the craft and, you know, and Tori Hall's, you know, an amazing playwright as well. So, yes. 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 Another question could be like, what do we miss? And I, I do miss theater um, a lot right now. And I, I, the museums are open. So, but I, those were the two, like going to shows and going to plays um, really I mean, the beginning of the, the pandemic. I mean, amongst all the hardness, but. Something I missed yeah. about something about being in those spaces um, was very difficult. Yeah. Two very brief uh, clarification questions. So earlier in the conversation, you were talking about an art therapist. Mm. Uh, it was just a question if you could repeat their their name. Oh, your sister. Oh, yeah. my sister Shaherazad. S C H E H E R A Z A D E. Till it uh, and. She's the executive director of A Long Walk Home, uh, which is a organization that uses art to en uh, empower young people to end violence against uh, girls and women that we've co-founded together. Thank you. And the second question was about the collective that you mentioned earlier, the full name of it. Was it the Negress? Okay. Was okay, I gotta find it right now. <laughs> I wish I had my uh, new Negress we have it right now, but uh, New Negress Film Collective, and they have a conference, a film, a virtual film conference going on right now, Black women's um, uh, films. So, but I could, you know, five seconds, I can get the actual title. New, and did you New find Negress it, Film it? Society. Yeah, the New uh, Negress Film Society. Yeah. Uh, and that's, oh, that's Jatamia Gary. And yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, she's yeah. so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Yvonne okay. Shirley is also um, in that as well, so I know it. And, oh, wonderful. Yeah. So thank so, you, thank you. So sorry, I mean, it's love. I'm so sorry I got the name wrong. So. Thanks so much. Great, um, thank you. On behalf of the Rutgers University Alumni Association, I just wanna thank Salamisha and Brittany for being here with us tonight. This was a great conversation, which, I didn't need any proof of, but there's definitely proof of it in the chat and the Q and A. So that's great. I just want to thank you both for being here and we look forward to talking to you soon and, and following your work. Thank Have you. Have a great thank night. You. Thank, thank you. You both. Okay. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.